O living flame of love that tenderly wounds my soul in its deepest center. Since now you are not oppressive, now consummate. If it be your will, tear through the veil of this sweet encounter. My name is Don Alonso Alvarez de Toledo. And I want to tell you the story of the greatest poet that Spain has ever known. I met him in 1554 when he was only a boy, very, very poor, but nevertheless extraordinary. I felt that even then. What was so extraordinary about him? Well, he didn't have an easy life. He suffered greatly. But inside, that's where the real drama was, in his heart. When a man is in love, and John was in love with God, he will never be satisfied with anything less than total union with his beloved. So he sought a life of contemplation and poverty and sacrifice in the Carmelite order. But I'm getting ahead of myself. Listen as I tell you the story of John of the Cross. Her name was Catalina Alvarez, and she was destitute and homeless. Her husband had just died, and bread was not to be had for any money. It was a three-day journey from her village to the town of Terijos. Yet she had to make the trip, for in Terijos lived the brother of her dead husband. This brother was wealthy, and perhaps he would help her small son John. It was her only hope. My brother was dead to me long ago, Senora. When he married you, he disgraced the Dieppe's family name. There is nothing I can do for you. But this is your nephew, your own flesh and blood, Senor. Look at him, look. Do not leave him in this misery. For God's mercy, Senor, have pity. This child is nothing to me. Please, Senora. You really must leave. Go away now. Catalina had nowhere to go. She continued on her journey, begging for food along the way, until she finally settled here, in Medina del Campo, where she found work as a weaver. Nine years passed, during which John grew into an exceptionally bright young boy, but he was isolated from the other children by his quiet nature. His mother loved him very much, and taught him to love God. My son, we are poor, it's true, but you must always remember to have hope, because we have our Lord and the Blessed Virgin to watch over us. Catalina was determined to get him an education. So she came to me one day and asked me to take John under my patronage 
so that he could attend the Jesuit college. I was the administrator of the plague hospital here in town, and I had a place for a quick-witted, eager and zealous boy who could assist me in caring for the sick. So I decided to help him. Where have you hidden, beloved, and left me moaning? You fled like the stag after wounding me. I went out calling you, and you were gone. Seeking my love, I will head for the mountains and for water sides. I will not gather flowers, nor fear wild beasts. I will go beyond strong men and frontiers. More years passed, and John grew into a remarkable young man. He had a special gift for caring for the sick. He was kind and very devout. He spent many hours in prayer, but the other students didn't understand that. They thought him a bit aloof. But I knew him better. He was a brilliant student, and I was so proud of him. However, I was concerned about his future. He had become like a son to me, and I didn't want to lose him. John, close that book for a minute. I need to talk to you. Yes, Don Alonso. You've been so preoccupied these past few weeks. You seem so far away. I'm sorry, Don Alonso. Don Alonso, you've been so kind to me. I feel I could never repay you. What nonsense. Do you know what a consolation you have been to me? I never had a son of my own, John. And you have become like my own flesh and blood. Don't worry your head about repaying me. I'm more than glad to have you here. No, no, Lonzo. Listen to me. I need to tell you something, even if it makes you angry. My final examinations are next month. And after that, I... No, no, Lonzo. I want to be a priest. Wonderful. Wonderful, my boy. Why ever did you hesitate to tell me? This is exactly what I had in mind for you all along. <laughs> then after you are ordained, I have a prestigious opportunity for you. I will appoint you the chaplain of the Plague Hospital. Now, what will your mother say to that, do you think? You don't understand. I can't stay. I have to... Did you ever love someone so much? That you're willing to give up everything for that person? Well, that's how I feel. I want to spend myself totally for my God. Only in total sacrifice of my will will I have any hope for peace on this earth. I believe I have found a place where such a life is possible. Don Alonso, God is calling me to enter the Carmelites. The Carmelites? John, you can't be serious. Do you have any idea what a common idea is? Why, all they do is pray. And you, with all your education, think of the good you could do here. How can you think of wasting your life, your mind, your talents? No, 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 no. I'm sure God wants you here in the hospital with me. But, Don Alonso, I... All your life you've been poor. All your life you've been an outcast. Do you think it will be any different with the Carmelites? It will be the same there. Please be practical. With me, you will have a comfortable life. Think of your poor mother. Under the circumstances, I must forbid you to leave. Don Alonso, I will think about what you have said. But I won't disobey God's call. One dark night, fired with love's urgent longings, ah, the sheer grace, I went out unseen my house being now all stilled. When I found out that he had left, I was filled with sadness. I suppose I felt he had rejected and turned his back on me. 
But I didn't realize then how right the Carmelite order would be for John. He had a passionate desire for prayer, and in their contemplative life, he could seek a union with God. Pouring out a thousand graces, he passed these groves in haste, and having looked at them, with his image alone, clothed them in beauty. On the 24th day of February, 1563, he was clothed with the Carmelite habit and took the name of Brother John of St. Matthias. What do you seek? The mercy of God, the poverty of the order, and the society of the brothers. Do you intend to persevere in religion till the end of your life? With the mercy of God and the prayers of the brothers, I do. I, Brother John, promise to show obedience, poverty, and chastity to God and to the Reverend Father, my brother, Juan Baptista Rubio of Ravenna, Prior General of the Order of Our Lady of Mount Carmel. I thank our Lord for the grace that he has granted me in allowing me to be admitted into an order of which our patron is God's blessed mother. John wanted to live the Carmelite life in all its fullness according to the primitive rule. However, not all the friars felt the way that he did. The monastery in which he lived had moved away from the original aim of the order, which was detachment from the world. Just as I predicted, John gradually began to meet with opposition and jealousy. You asked to see me, Father Maldonado? Yes, Fray John of St. Matthias. Please, please sit. Take some wine. It's an excellent vintage. No, thank you, Father. Fray John, I'm concerned about something. Your name has come up a number of times. It seems that some of the brothers feel that you are not really participating in the life of the community that you hold yourself apart. 
Father Maldonado, if I've offended anyone in the community, I'm truly sorry. I've seen the way they look at me. I'm not surprised. I like to be by myself. I came to Carmel to pray to God, to love God. But I have found all my desires frustrated since I entered the order. Now, I'm not going to say that you are praying too much. That would be ridiculous, of course. But you're so intense. The other brothers say that you act as if you think you are holier than they are. Moderation, my dear Fry John. You should learn to relax and enjoy life a little more. But Father Maldonado, don't you long for something more, something deeper? Isn't that why we both became Carmelites? Sometimes my heart is so full that I feel as if there were a burning flame of love within me, so strong that it could consume my whole being. How can I contain these feelings of love? How can I seek moderation in my desire for God? It seems our order has slid dangerously down at the slope of indulgence, Father. Aren't we called to live in total poverty, relying on the mercy of God? All I seek is to live in detachment from my appetites, so I can't understand what you want of me. You can't understand what I want? Well, let me make myself more clear. You are a fanatic. There is no place for your extreme ideas in this order, I can tell you that. Fry John, let me warn you. Unless you change your rebellious ways, your days as a Carmelite will be over. Why, since you wounded this heart, don't you heal it? And why, since you stole it from me, do you leave it so? and fail to carry off what you have stolen. Extinguish these miseries, since no one else can stamp them out. And may my eyes behold you, because you are their light, and I would open them to you alone. Her name was Madre Teresa de Jesus, Teresa of Avila, and she was the most remarkable woman then living in Spain. For it was she who started the great reform movement within the Carmelite order, a return to the primitive rule. Her followers were called discalced Carmelites because they wore no shoes on their feet. What kind of changes do you plan to make within our monastery, Mother? Simply to teach the sisters about the incredible love of Jesus as our founder originally intended. Shall we go in now? Oh Lord, how is it that you command the impossible? I know what you're calling me to do, but how? How am I to lead the reform, not just of the nuns, but of the friars as well? If only you would send me some sign some friar who would share my vision. How long, O oh Lord, how long must I wait? Dear Jesus, forgive me. I'm too impatient. But if you want me to do this, send me a friar. God always listened to Mother Teresa. It wasn't long before she found her friar. In 1567, the year John was ordained a priest, these two mystics, these two giants of the faith, met for the first time. What a moment that must have been. Darkness and secure by the secret ladder disguised. Ah, the sheer grace in darkness and concealment, my house being now all still.
Peace be with you, Fry John of St. Matthias. And also with you, Madre Teresa de Jesus. Fry John, I've heard some disturbing things about you that have made me suspect that you might be just the man I'm looking for. I know what you've heard. I suppose they've told you that I'm a failure as a Carmelite. I guess it's true. I don't fit in with the rest of the brothers. I seem to be heading in a very different direction. Yes. The question is, in what direction are you heading? Oh, Madre Teresa. I want to climb to the summit of the mountain. I want to attain perfect union with God. And I want to do it very quickly because my heart is overflowing with love. And your brothers do not share your longing or your impatience? When I speak of leaving behind all earthly things and of avoiding spiritual obstacles, they accuse me of pride and self-righteousness. And I suppose this is always a danger. Yes, yes, they misunderstand you. I know all about that danger, and about your longing, too. I'm traveling through a dark night that is difficult to explain. I've not found in the order what I came to seek, a life of contemplation of our beloved. I am taking steps to withdraw from Carmel and to become a hermit. I've asked the Carthusians to receive me. Patience, Fry John. Patience. How can you think of leaving the Order on the eve of its rebirth? You've heard, I suppose, of the reforms that I'm instituting among the nuns? Yes, yes, it's wonderful what you're doing, Mother. The Prior General has granted permission for the foundation of two houses of contemplative Carmelites. Not just for the nuns, but for the friars as well. You, my young outcast, are going to lead the reform of the friars. Mother Teresa. How can you say that? <laughs> the friars won't listen to me. <laughs> I don't care about that. You're probably right. I have just one question for you. Are you ready for the cross? I long for suffering and to be forgotten. Yes, Fry John. God will grant the desires of your heart. Join with me in renewing the Carmelite family and you will climb that mountain to your beloved. I'm willing to join you, but under one condition. Let there be no delay. Fry John, let your soul be at rest. It shall be done by God. O living flame of love that tenderly wounds my soul in its deepest center. Since now you are not oppressive, now consummate. If it be your will, tear through the veil of this sweet encounter. O lamps of fire, in whose splendors the deep caverns of feeling, once obscure and blind, now give forth so rarely, so exquisitely, both warmth and light to their beloved. How gently and lovingly you wake in my heart, where in secret you dwell alone and by your sweet breathing, filled with good and glory, how tenderly you swell my heart with love. Dear Madre Anna, what an exciting time it is. The reform is really beginning to take hold. Our faithful friar has a new name, Fry John of the Cross, and he is fulfilling all my expectations. I feel I have finally found a partner to share this work with me. Fry John knows what the true Carmelite spirit demands, nothing less than perfection. 
I recently invited him to live in a stone hut just outside the monastery walls, and I think he's happy here with us. He is embraced an austere life with a passion and seems to thrive on suffering. However, the other friars don't appreciate his good example. It pricks their consciences. Many of them hate him, yet he is kindness itself for the poor and the sick. I have set him to work as the spiritual advisor of the sisters. He can teach them much about the interior life. Indeed, I myself am learning from him. He is such a wonderful confessor and teacher, never rushing while directing a person to a deeper relationship with God. However, our work here is challenging, to say the least. The sisters enjoy his talks and spiritual direction, but they have a long way to go. This monastery is great only in regards to its size. The nuns in Avila are notorious for their worldliness and their gossiping. In fact, things are so bad that the convent of the Incarnation has been called Babylon. <laughs> Don't you think Father Ramirez is handsome? Sister Maria, I heard that your God has made it to your sword. And she never listens. She always gives me the same penance. Gradually, over the course of three years, a transformation began to take place at Avila. In its simple, persistent way, Father John taught the sisters who so love to talk to love to pray. For prayer is, after all, a talking to God. In nome del Patris, di Filito, Spiritus Sancti. Amen. Jesus be in your souls. Dear sisters, you should live in the monastery as if no one else were in it. Never meddling in things that happen in the community, nor with individuals. Take no notice of their good or bad qualities or their conduct. You are like the stone, which must be chiseled and fashioned before being used in the building. Those who are in the monastery are craftsmen, placed there by God to mortify you by chiseling at you. Some will chisel you with words, telling you what you would rather not hear. Others, by deed, doing to you what you would rather not endure. Others, by their temperament, being in their person and in their actions, a bother and an annoyance to you. And others, by their thoughts, neither esteeming nor feeling love for you. If this was not your reason, for entering the monastery, you should not have done so, but should have remained in the world to seek your comfort, honor, reputation, and ease. Strive to pray constantly in all you do. Undertake all things, agreeable or disagreeable, for the sole purpose of pleasing God by carrying Christ's cross. So, sisters, do not engage yourself in something less, nor pay heed to the crumbs which fall from your father's table. Go forth and exult in your glory. Hide yourself in it and rejoice, and you will obtain the desires of your heart. Following your footprints, maidens run along the way. The touch of a spark, the spiced wine, cause flowings in them from the balsam of God. In the inner wine cellar, I drank of my beloved, and when I went abroad through all this valley, I no longer knew anything and lost the herd which I was following. The monastery changed from a Babylon to a holy Jerusalem. 
but persecution was beginning to mount within the order. Father Maldonado, the sisters flock around him as if he were a great saint. We are losing all our influence, and it's all because of him. Who does this man think he is? He's all the time alone with the nuns. The whole thing seems suspicious. I tell you, Father Maldonado, this man is dangerous. Something must be done. Father John, I need to speak to you. Mother Teresa. Father John. I'm frightened. You, Mother? What could frighten you? I'm not as brave as I look. I've pulled you into this life, and I feel responsible for your well-being. Yes, Mother. There are friars in the Order, Fry John, who will stop at nothing to kill the Reform. Yes, I know. God permits the devil to blind and delude many. I fear for your very life, Fry John. They see that other friars are following you into the reform movement. I tell you, the war is on. Mother, listen to me. You must try always to want, not the easiest, but the most difficult. Let us not choose a light burden, for the heavier the burden is, the lighter it becomes when we carry it for Christ. In silence and in hope, shall our strength be. So you embrace the cross, whatever that might mean. No regrets. No regrets, Mother. Only great joy and love. I have important news. Father Tostado, the Visitor General of the Order, will arrive here tomorrow to carry out the mandate of the General Chapter. The reform will be suppressed. For neither Madre Teresa nor Father John of the Cross have received any authorization for what they do. Mother Teresa will be ordered to retire in one convent and not stir. She's a meddlesome and restless nun. And we all know that she has a long arm. But this Father John is a different matter. He refuses to renounce the reform. Things have gotten out of control. The Visitor General has ordered his immediate arrest and interrogation. I authorize you to carry out this injunction tonight. Use force if necessary. In darkness and concealment, my house being now all still, on that glad night, in secret, for no one saw me, nor did I look at anything, with no other light or guide than the one that burned in my heart. By John of the Cross, you're under arrest in the name of Father Maldonado? Yes. I was expecting this. Father Tostado, this man is a disobedient, rebellious, and contumacious member of the Discalced Carmelites. By his arrogant pride, he censures his brothers. And by his extreme actions, he is instigating a movement among the friars that could destroy the very life of our order. Well, Father John of the Cross, the Visitor General is prepared to show compassion. After all, 
We are all brothers. I appeal to your sense of religious obedience. Father Maldonado, I'm simply doing what the church and lawful authority have commissioned me to do. What is the use of your resistance? We will stop you one way or another, you can be sure of that. But Father John, we have been friends a long time. I have always admired your great mind. You have great potential, which you are wasting with Madre Teresa. You should use your talents to do good among your brothers. If you renounce the reform here and now, the Visitor General is prepared to offer you the rank of prior. You shall have a comfortable quarters and your own library. How do you answer, Fry John? He who seeks Christ, stripped of all things, has no need of gold or jewels or honors. Then you are confirmed in your error. Father John of the Cross, since you have refused due acceptance of these orders and letters, alleging in your excuse lies and fabrications, I declare you unworthy to hold office in the Carmelite order. You will be held in solitary confinement until you renounce this rebellion. Strip him of his cowl and scapula. Take him away. Where shall we put him, Father Maldonado? I know the perfect place that will break his will, if nothing else can. You know that little room that adjoins the chamber upstairs? You mean the storeroom, Father? He'll go mad shut up in that airless tomb. Yes, indeed. Indeed. In here, priest. This stubborn brother will soon come to his senses. Bread and water only. This guided me more surely than the light of noon to where he waited for me, him I knew so well, in a place where no one else appeared. Eight months passed in that dark and stifling cell, but John never wavered. What more do you want, O oh soul? What else do you search for outside? When within yourself you possess your riches, delights, satisfactions, fullness and kingdom, your beloved whom you desire and seek, the kingdom of God. Is within you. Why do I bother with this pig-headed man? If he were to disappear, no one would ever know the difference. Should he ever leave here at all, it will only be for the cemetery. Be joyful and gladdened in your interior recollection with him, O oh precious soul, for you have him so close to you. Desire him there, adore him there. Even though he does abide within you, he is hidden. Nevertheless, it is vital for you to know the place of his hiding so that you might search for him there with assuredness. This man is a fool, indicted as a rebel, not worthy of the name of Christian. He is a hypocrite of the worst kind. I know why he wishes to go barefoot and clad in a coarse habit, so that he might be venerated as a saint. Anyone who is to find a hidden treasure must enter the hiding place secretly. And once he has discovered it, he shall also be hidden just as the treasure is hidden. In order to find him, you should forget all your possessions and all creatures and hide within the interior secret chamber of your spirit. Who has sown the seeds of revolt in the order? Who is to blame for all of this? It is none other than John of the Cross, a wretched little friar who has plunged us all into trouble and disunity. Come then, O oh beautiful soul, 
since you know now that your desired beloved lives hidden within your heart, strive to be really hidden within, and you will embrace him within you and experience him with loving affection. Sister, in the face of so many enemies, I have found it impossible to sit with my hands folded. I've gone to all the authorities, but no one can give me any idea of his whereabouts. It's as if he's fallen off the edge of the earth. Cry down of the cross is a saint, a treasure who must be returned immediately. <sighs> Dear Lord, you treat your friends so terribly at times. It's no wonder you have so few. During these trying months, God, in his secret way, converted the most inactive period of John's life into the most intense. He was able to make friends with his kind jailer, who took pity on his miserable circumstances and gave him some paper and ink. And so it was there, in that prison cell, that John composed some of the most sublime and mystical poetry ever written. My beloved, the mountains and lonely wooded valleys, strange islands and resounding rivers, the whistling of love stirring breezes. the time of the rising dawn, silent music, sounding solitude, the supper that refreshes and deepens love. Oh, beloved Jesus, if I am destined to die here, thy will be done. But if you want me to escape, inspire me. Why don't you arise when I come in to see you? Get up, Fry John of the Cross. Excuse me, Your Reverence. It is with great difficulty that I rise now, for I am very weak. You will die in this foul tomb if you continue your obstinacy. This has gone on far too long. I don't understand you. What are you thinking, Fry John? I was thinking that tomorrow is Our Lady's Feast of the Assumption, and you know how I must feel. I would be very happy, Father, if I might be able to save Mass. Not while I'm here. Unless you repent, you will never say Mass again. God, secure the door. One dark night, fired with love's urgent longings, ah, the sheer grace, I went out unseen, my house being now all still.
O guiding night, O night more lovely than the dawn, O night that has united the lover with his beloved, transforming the beloved in her lover. Upon my heart, which I had kept holy for him alone, there he lay sleeping, and I caressing him, there in a breeze from the fanning cedars. When the breeze blew from the fortress wall, parting his hair, he wounded my neck with his gentle hand, suspending all my senses. I abandoned and forgot myself, laying my face on my beloved. All things ceased. I went out from myself, leaving my cares forgotten among the lilies. Mother, there's a man at the gate. He says he's a friar, but he's dressed in rags. I tried to turn him away, but he insists on seeing you. Very well, I will see him. Right, John of the Cross, what have they done to you? Dear Mother Teresa, I have escaped this night from prison. Oh, thanks be to God, but are you being followed? Do they know where you are? They soon will, Madre. Sister, we must hide Fray John of the Cross in the cleaning room. Hurry now. Yes. Deo gracias. Madre Teresa. We have urgent business. Is by chance Fray John of the Cross here? Your Reverence, it would be a miracle if you were to find any friar here. Are you sure, Madre? Absolutely sure. Yes, Father. Let us go. Our business here is finished. John would have to leave the monastery, for only in a distant part of the country could he hope to be safe from the long reach of the Calst friars. And so, on the morning of his departure, he spoke to Mother Teresa and the sisters. My daughters in Christ, did not the Messiah, the Word of God, our beloved, have to undergo all these things so as to enter into his glory. Sisters, I confess that never in my life have I felt such contentment nor enjoyed such an abundance of supernatural light and sweetness as during my imprisonment. The Calst Friars are indeed my great benefactors. O oh, sisters, he that seeks not the cross of Christ, seeks not the glory of Christ. Love consists not in feeling great things, but in having great detachment and in suffering for the beloved. O oh, my daughters, let Christ crucified be sufficient for you, and with him suffer and take your rest. Be strong in your heart against all things that move you to that which is not God. And for Christ's sake, love suffering.
As the sisters gazed at him silently, his body was raised above the ground. He stayed there for an hour of high prayer. When he finally returned to Earth, he said goodbye to the sisters and started on his way. Let us rejoice, beloved, and let us go forth to behold ourselves in your beauty, to the mountain and to the hill, to where the pure water flows, and further, deep into the thicket. And then we will go on to the high caverns in the rock, which are so well concealed. There we shall enter and taste the fresh juice of the pomegranates. There you will show me what my soul has been seeking, and then you will give me, you, my life, will give me there what you gave me on that other day. The breathing of the air, the song of the sweet nightingale, the grove and its living beauty in the serene night, with the flame that is consuming and painless. Thank you. 